It takes a lot for WWE to explicitly acknowledge an existing competitor on their airwaves. Though in the early stages of the Monday Night Wars, WCW and their red-hot program Nitro clearly qualified as a lot, seeing as they presented objectively a fresher, hipper alternative to Monday Night Raw. The early success of Nitro, along with relentless prodding from Eric Bischoff, showed the previously unchallenged World Wrestling Federation that they were in a very real fight for first place. It led to Vince McMahon allocating space on his weekly programs solely to fire back at WCW. But what began as a harmless exercise in satire quickly lost its good-natured sheen, exposing a more bitter motive on the part of the WWF boss. In the autumn of 1995, WCW Nitro won more head-to-head -head battles than they lost against WWF Raw. It wasn't much more, but it was enough of an acquired upper hand to where those who thought Eric Bischoff had no shot at beating the omnipotent WWF began eating a little crow. There were many reasons why Nitro drew such interest, even against an established USA Network wrestling franchise. For one thing, the main event was filled with household names, quite a few of whom had headlined in the WWF to some degree over the prior few years. Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage may have been longer in the tooth, but each possessed a higher Q rating than the younger Diesel and Shawn Michaels. Another enticing aspect of Nitro was the fact that it felt like an event. Almost every single broadcast was live, whereas Raw only ran live once a month. The rest of their month's worth of one-hour broadcasts were taped the same night as the live show, meaning some episodes of Raw were airing three weeks after they'd been filmed. There's no room for spontaneity with that kind of broadcast model, and a home viewer can tell the difference between genuine audience energy and a droning crowd sweetener that can't exactly disguise the sight of 1,500 fans sitting on their hands while fighting slumber. There was also the fact that Nitro, in an attempt to be different than Vince's show, was more keen on throwing out pay-per-view level matches on free TV, whereas Raw still adhered to a more minimalist formula. While there's really nothing wrong with the WWF method as far as not giving away too much and simply using TV to build to the pay-per-views, when your competitor's putting on a weekly fireworks show, you holding up two measly sparklers just isn't gonna cut it. Worse for the WWF, somebody in WCW took sadistic pleasure in pointing out the archaic nature of the Federation's programming. Eric Bischoff was WCW's senior vice president, but he was also Nitro's lead announcer, mirroring Vince's duties on the opposition. From his commentary perch, Bischoff pulled back the curtain on the taped episodes of Raw, giving away results for those weeks where the matches were warmed over. The most oft-cited example came from the second ever episode of Nitro, in which Bischoff crowed about how the viewer didn't need to flip on Raw, seeing as Shawn Michaels was going to beat Psycho Sid with a superkick that, in his words, couldn't earn a green belt at a local YMCA. In times where only a tiny fraction of the viewership was wired to the internet, spoilers like this weren't so readily available. To less savvy viewers, Bischoff's soon-to-be regular practice of revealing Raw's results for the night highlighted the stark difference between vivid, unpredictable Nitro and colorless, formulaic Raw. Nitro's regular ratings victories and Bischoff's gleeful spotlighting of Raw's shortcomings had begun to wear on McMahon and the WWF. By the end of 1995, McMahon and company got to work producing their rebuttal to those repeated jabs. Not by working to improve the issues that Bischoff ridiculed or by trying to outdo the Nitro product. Rather, with parody. Thus, Billionaire Ted's Rasslin' War Room was born. 
The War Room began as a simple ad campaign, premiering during the Raw that aired on New Year's Night 1996. While Hulk Hogan battled WCW champion Ric Flair over on TNT, the WWF countered by lampooning the age of the stars on the other channel. The skit featured a Turner stand-in, billionaire Ted as it were, sitting at the head of a conference table surrounded by various suits, one of whom was an unnamed Vince Russo making one of his first on-camera appearances for the WWF. There was also a disheveled looking Hogan imposter and somebody dressed up like Savage, this duo known respectively as the Huckster and the Nacho Man. There was even a mean Gene analogue, dubbed Scheme Gene, as a send-up of Oakland's shameless teasers for the WCW hotline that he owned and operated. In the ad, billionaire Ted, speaking in a sort of Jimmy Stewart-like stammer, presides over a meeting in which the executives try to pitch new maneuvers for the Huckster and Nacho Man to add to their repertoires. These included devastating-looking WWF finishers like Diesel's Jackknife Powerbomb and Ahmed Johnson's Pearl River Plunge. The two decrepit-looking wrestlers repeatedly balked at doing any maneuver that required peak strength and conditioning, with Huckster noting that at his age, his feet no longer left the ground. When billionaire Ted inquired as to what they could do, the not-so-mega-powers went into their outdated posing routines before Huckster clutched his chest and crumpled to the floor. The concluding voiceover stated that you can't teach an old dog new tricks, before adding the new WWF generation, on top of the hill, not over it. It wasn't the most scathing of satires, but the message was pretty simple. We have younger, fresher stars that represent the future of wrestling, while WCW trots out old geezers with nothing new to say. Given that Bischoff was ridiculing WWF's entire television model with spoilers week after week, and seeing as he just had Medusa physically trash the WWF women's title on his program, this was a rather light-hearted, mostly benign retort from McMahon's camp. However, the tone would not stay light-hearted. Had the sole crux of billionaire Ted's wrestling war room been demonstrating the superiority of WWF's roster from an action and excitement standpoint, with a few ages jibes at the competitor, it would have been fair play from McMahon and the WWF. But the ages of the WCW main eventers weren't going to be the lone targets of Vince's ire. In the war room skit that aired on January 8th, billionaire Ted and the gang brainstormed a new catchphrase for their company. There were a few more digs at age, sure, but the real juiciness came when Nacho Man pitched Where the Big Boys Play, which was WCW's actual slogan of the day. However, nervous Nacho then had second thoughts, fearing that calling attention to any bigness on the part of WCW wrestlers would lead to them having to test for steroids. Huckster told him not to worry, they'd never have to test for roids again because they weren't in the WWF anymore, brother. Immediately after that night's Raw, McMahon released a statement, saying in part that the World Wrestling Federation is concerned about the health and well-being of its talent. Although on tonight's Raw program we use satire to demonstrate a point about WWF's steroid policy as opposed to Ted Turner's WCW, we realize that the use of steroids and other drugs of abuse is a serious issue and can pose health risks. You don't say. The statement went on to challenge Turner and WCW to adopt a drug testing policy similar to that of the WWF's, in the interest of health and well-being of all the athletes under his umbrella. The WWF sent letters of similar sentiment to Turner himself and to WCW attorney Nick Lambros. In response, Bischoff penned a letter to McMahon, calling the Federation's latest attempt at satire defamatory and disparaging to WCW and its wrestlers, while informing McMahon that his legal counsel was reviewing the matter. Bischoff went on to tell McMahon that WCW had a drug testing policy in place, and closed by stating, While we can appreciate your intent in combining the efforts of the WWF with certain facets of our programs, we are not so inclined. McMahon's response to the letter was to show freeze frames of Bischoff's writings on WWF programming, because, well, for some kind of gotcha moment, apparently. But the WWF did score one minor victory with the sketch. WCW briefly shelved their Where the Big Boys Play motto for a few weeks, perhaps to let any possible connection between big boys and synthetic enhancement fade from people's minds. 
The next two weeks of War Room parodies continued to hit at Hogan and Savage for being washed up, and at WCW for apparently not having any original ideas, instead relying on Stanford's leftovers to build their empire. In other words, pretty straightforward satirical attacks in the vein of the original skit. Then came the sketch that aired on January 29th. If the shots at Huckster and Nacho were sporting jabs, this was an aggressive knee straight to the groin, and it was aimed squarely at Ted Turner. In this skit, billionaire Ted held a press conference while flanked by Huckster, Nacho, and some random suits. The inquisitive media on hand asked Ted several questions about his wrestling programming, particularly why he put his wrestling show directly up against Raw when, as owner of his networks, he could have chosen any other time slot. He was quizzed about undercutting ad rates on his bevy of wrestling shows and was also asked point blank if he was trying to kill the WWF. For the most part, billionaire Ted was evasive and a bit nervous. And at the very end of the skit, he was asked what he wouldn't do to put the WWF out of business. With a bit of an anxious chuckle, Ted responded that he wouldn't use his own money to do so, prompting annoyance from the Huckster and Nacho. Suddenly feeling standoffish, Ted begins fumbling around his suit jacket looking for something before yelling off screen, Jane, where's my lithium? These were references to Ted Turner's then wife Jane Fonda, and the fact that Turner had, for a period, taken lithium as a mood stabilizer in treating his bipolar disorder. Taking a shot at Turner's mental health struggles seems a little out of bounds for a war contested over squared circle offerings. That, and Vince alleging that Turner was trying to drive him out of business, while also alleging possible steroid use on the part of his headliners, reads ironic to the eyes of many. But Vince wasn't done. He was making the war not about the on-screen products, but questioning the faith in Turner's business dealings. At the time, Turner Broadcasting was deep in merger negotiations with media group Time Warner, and Vince was attempting to sabotage it. By having billionaire Ted say that he's not spending his own money to kill the WWF, the implication was that Ted Turner was wasting his own stockholders' money to try and drive Vince and company into ruin through a targeted campaign. McMahon went so far as to try and take out an ad in different financial magazines, questioning Turner's motives. The ad wrote, Attention stockholders, has Ted Turner lost $40 million of your money in his personal vendetta against the World Wrestling Federation? Where are those losses reported in TBS's financial statements? Time Warner, beware. The billionaire Ted skit that aired February 5th reflected this idea, a continuation of the press conference wherein billionaire Ted admits that he doesn't care about wasting stockholder money on a pro wrestling vanity project. Many financial publications refused to run the ad on grounds that it was defamatory, though the New York Times permitted a softened version for print. Nonetheless, the WWF aired a freeze frame of the ad on its programs, for all of their fans to see. For the record, Turner and Time Warner officially merged in October of 1996, and these digs from the WWF side really did no damage. Of course, Turner would later regret dealing with Time Warner, but that's a whole other story. For now, however, the sketches continued through the winter months and included parodies of the talk show Larry King Live, which alternated between taking shots at WCW Creative and at Turner the Businessman. There was also a Jeopardy parody in which all the answers were questionable statements made by Turner through the years. And these skits were considered a major priority. As was written in Sex, Lies and Headlocks, the more elaborate the skits, the more Vince became willing to stop the company's work to produce them. Employees were sent emails directing them to drop what they were doing because extras were urgently needed in the WWF's in-house production studios. But the skit that aired on March 18th, that was a doozy. On this night, billionaire Ted provided testimony before the Federal Trade Commission regarding the merger. At several junctures, the question askers pointedly queried Ted about trying to put the WWF out of business, at which point the sketch descends into a spoof of Jack Nicholson's famed You Can't Handle the Truth speech from A Few Good Men. After Ted affirms his wish to destroy the World Wrestling Federation, the words to be continued appear on the screen. The image then fades to black, replaced by a message urging viewers to write to the FTC in the hopes that they can prevent Turner from gaining more power in the field of cable TV. The skit may have concluded with the words to be continued, but the funny thing is, it wouldn't continue. 
USA Network President Kay Koplovitz intervened due to the increasingly hostile and malicious tone of the skits, as they clearly moved away from mocking their competition's product to personally attacking the man at the top. Koplovitz also understood that Turner's control over a large volume of cable outfits, which chose to broadcast USA Network, meant that doing something regrettable to draw Turner's ire would not be a good business decision. Thus, Koplovitz put an end to the billionaire Ted skits, and demanded that all scripts for Raw were to be reviewed by an overseer going forward. The Few Good Men cliffhanger would never be revisited. However, McMahon did get in one last dig at the War Room gang away from the USA Network. During the pre-show of WrestleMania 12, a pre-taped match pitted Huckster against Nacho Man, with billionaire Ted officiating. The two wrestlers quickly dropped dead from heart attacks after overexerting themselves, because, you know, they're old. Never mind the fact that one of those being parodied would win the WWF title six years later. And Ted didn't seem to care about the dueling expirations, saying that he could just buy more stars. But when a masked Federal Trade Commission rep showed up during the match, Ted himself dropped dead of a heart attack. McMahon and Lawler provided commentary for the farce, silhouetted in like an episode of Mystery Science Theater. And when Ted keeled over, McMahon deadpanned So Long Ted. WrestleMania 12 then commenced, featuring performances from 41-year-old Rowdy Roddy Piper, 38-year-old Bret Hart, and WrestleMania 6 headliner Ultimate Warrior in high-profile matches. Other than perhaps making Vince laugh a little, the WWF didn't gain much from those War Room skits. The more innocent ones didn't draw too much anger from the subjects being parodied. Bischoff even claims that Turner himself laughed his ass off when he saw them. Hogan believes that the sketch has backfired, saying it made fans turn on WCW to see if Hulk Hogan was really pushing a walker. It made people look to see if I was really that washed up. In other words, something akin to a pro wrestling Streisand effect. Reportedly, Savage was the only target that was miffed, and he lamented being portrayed as a washed up mercenary that betrayed the WWF for greener pastures. As far as the war room being ineffective, Bischoff wrote that the WWF didn't have a clear understanding of why their audience had left them, and wouldn't acknowledge the fact that we found a formula that was successful. All they had left was to make fun of us. WCW themselves even got in on the act. When Scott Hall invaded Nitro that May, vaguely cast as a WWF-affiliated trespasser, he asked where billionaire Ted, the Nacho Man, and Scheme Gene all were, ostensibly using pet names invented by a second-place team that was left resorting to childish name-calling. Events before and after those War Room skits aired revealed many hypocrisies of the WWF taking the tack of morally upstanding little guy crying foul in the face of a powerful opponent. Though Vince's empire ultimately won the war, it's fascinating to see how the chairman acted when things weren't looking too hot for him. Billionaire Ted's wrestling War Room existed for less than three months and really had no significant bearing on the Monday Night Wars. Yet, they remain an unforgettable chapter in a historic pro wrestling conflict, simply for the fact that after years of industry dominance, a wrestling promotion that never acknowledged its competitors was finally forced to do so, and they did in about the strangest way imaginable. <laughs>